Thanks to you so much, uh, Nicola uh, McConkie, for coming and telling us about uh, SBND results. Thanks for coming here from all the way from scenic Manchester. Um, take it away. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. And thanks to the organizers for um, inviting me to present uh, the status of the short baseline near detector uh, on behalf of the SBND collaboration. So SBND is the near detector for the short baseline neutrino program, which is a three detector measurement system, uh, which sits in Fermilab's low energy neutrino beam, uh, the booster neutrino beam, which has a peak neutrino energy of around one GeV. So all of these three detectors are liquid argon time projection chambers. Um, and so that means that the interactions are happening in the same nuclear target and detector technology. Um, and something else with regards to the technology that I want to mention straight away is that SBND has a high coverage photon detection system. Um, so Icarus and Microgoon, the detectors already exist and are taking data or have taken data in the, in the beam already. Um, and so there are several of the talks in this session and at this conference, um, including a plenary talk. And I encourage you to check those out to get more, uh, to get more information about Icarus and Microbeam. Uh, however, so I'm going to be focusing on the SBND detector, which is the near detector for the SBN physics program. So SBN will measure neutrino oscillations over a baseline of about one kilometer. Um, and that places it in an excellent position to probe the existence of sterile neutrinos, particularly sterile neutrinos with a mass squared splitting of around one EV squared. Um, so as most of you will know, there are many hints of sterile neutrinos in our field. And um, in terms of electron neutrino appearance in a muon neutrino beam, um, this plot shows uh, in blue the LSMD, uh, the LSMD allowed region. And you can see the red dotted lines in the sensitivity of the SBN program. And um, it will cover this entire phase space at three sigma, and most of it will be covered at, at five sigma significance. But what's great about SBN is that we can not only measure electron neutrino appearance, but we also have sensitivity to measure muon neutrino disappearance. And our detectors are very powerful, um, and this is becoming more and more necessary in, in the uh, in the the uh, scenario, the the more and more complicated scenarios um, involving uh, sterile neutrinos that that uh, are becoming possible uh, in our field. So SBND, as the near detector, um, has the role of measuring the unoscillated neutrino flux, which is absolutely crucial critical for the sensitivity of the oscillation measurement. Um, and because the detector technologies are the same, there's highly correlated interactions in the near and far detector. Um, and this helps a lot with the uncertain, with a lot of the uncertainties, uh, both the flux and interact interaction uncertainties in the sterile neutrino search. So as well as being the near detector for the SBN program, um, SBND has a rich physics program of its own. Uh, measuring uh, neutrino argon interactions. And in fact, uh, SBND will have an unprecedentedly large data set um, of, of neutrino argon interactions. And because of this high interaction rate and coupled with the liquid argon TPC technology, it will allow us to make precision measurements of exclusive event topologies, not just for muon neutrino exclusive events, but also uh, electron neutrinos, we have enough, we have, we will have around uh, 50,000 UE interactions in, in the three years of running. Um, and that will allow us to do direct experimental quantification of nuclear effects uh, in, in neutrino argon scattering. Um, and it'll allow us to feed back into the, the generators and allow us to discriminate between different final state interaction models. Um, and this is especially important in the low energy uh, regime of neutrino interactions. So there are also many exciting opportunities for measurement of beyond standard model physics uh, SBND because we have a high intensity beam and a detector proximate to the target. So that means that we're sensitive to 
any and all new states that are produced in the beam, for example, heavy neutral leptons, neutrino tridents, millicharged particles. And these are motivated by various other physics uh, theories like dark matter and, and also by the G muon G minus um, two. And Pedro, Mac Pedro Machado has a talk on Thursday um, and I encourage you to go to that if you'd like more detail of, of these BSM things. So uh, as this is the first liquid argon TPC talk in this conference, I feel I should give a brief overview of the technology and, and uh, how it works. So the entirety of the detector will be filled with liquid argon. So we have the entire active volume that is between a cathode and a wire readout anode, uh, which gives a drift field across the entire detector. And as interactions happen in the detector, the uh, charged particles will deposit energy, um, producing uh, ionization electrons and scintillation photons along the tracks and showers. And these ionization electrons will drift in this drift field towards the re wire readout anode. Now the wire, the, the wire readout anode for SBND has three planes of wires at angles, which gives us uh, a 2D readout of the entire of entirety of the detector. And the third dimension comes from the time of drifting of the, the charged particles in the drift field, hence the name time projection chamber. So LATPCs give three dimensional, very granular data across the entirety of the volume, which is brilliant for particle ID. And you can see this this electron neutrino candidate event from microboon, uh, where you can you can clearly see um, the showers and the tracks, and you can even see the Bragg peaks um, at the end of the tracks, um, and it's just beautiful. I'm biased. But. So SVND um, is a completely new LAT UPC, um, which gives wonderful opportunities for both neutrino physics and R and D, which I find quite exciting. So SVND itself um, has about 112 active tons of liquid argon, which makes it slightly bigger than microbeam. Um, and we have a central cathode and two wire readout planes on either side. And that means that we have two drift volumes. The electrons will drift away from the central cathode to these wire readout anodes. And the entire thing is surrounded by a field cage uh, that shapes the electric field. And uh, on the outside of the on the outside of the wire planes, uh, we have photon detection system module, which looks in from behind both sides of uh, the the um, behind the wire planes. So, the current state of SVND is the core topic of this of this um, this talk, and the SVND assembly is continuing as we speak. Um, SVND was uh yeah 2021 was a big year for detector assembly and we did a lot of installation of most of the detector components and um in parallel to that the cryostat installation is progressing in a separate building to where we're building the detector and the daq system and software framework and commissioning plans all these things that we'll need going forward are all maturing in parallel and i'm going to present highlights here uh, with a special focus on the detector uh, assembly because that's my baby and um, it's one of the things that I find the most exciting. So here is here's um, a picture from when we would first installed the cathode plane frame. Uh, and this is one of the wire wire planes being moved around and and here's some cold electronics freshly installed. So one of the most critical components of the SBND TPC um, is the wire readout planes. And they were actually constructed, uh, each, each wire plane was constructed in two halves. So this and this are separate pieces of the detector. Um, and one of the key tasks was to assemble these. Um, and here you can see we're looking at the alignment of these two detector components because we needed to make sure that the wires were perfectly in the same plane. Uh, before we mechanically coupled them together and then electrically coupled them, because the readout is of an entire wire spanning the two, two frames. And I just wanted to share with you a video sped up of um, 
two of one of the key days of our detector assembly. So the wire planes were assembled in this tent uh, in a horizontal position. And of course, in the detector, they need to be in the vertical position. So we had to bring this out of the tent, uh, disconnect the mechanical, uh, disconnect the gantry crane, um, make, make um, adjustments to this so that we could pick it up. Um, and then we are preparing the space in which we're installing the detector. So this tent moves back, uh, the crane is atta and attached and the, the, detect the wire plane is lifted up and installed. Um, and then the detector tent is closed up again. So looks very easy here, but it was a hard day's work. Um, but it was very, oh, it was a very uh, successful process and both wire readout planes are now installed in the detector. So here you can see one drift volume. So this is the cathode plane and the wire plane is installed. And here you can see the readout electronics that are installed on the top and on the side of the wire planes. Um, and the signal from the from straight from the wires and is preamplified and digitized in the cold. So it's actually a digital signal that's taken out from the detector um, out into the warm electronics. So I mentioned that one very important part of SBND is the photon detection system. And um, it, since argon itself actually scintillates at 128 nanometers, which is in the vacuum ultraviolet, violet, it's challenging for conventional readout technology. So SBND actually uses three different technologies, photomultiplier tubes, which are kind of the standard, and those four out of five of these are are coated with wavelength shifter so that they're sensitive to the light. Um, another, another active technology that is used is ex-Arapuka devices. So this technology um, essentially uses dichroic filters and waveguides to increase the active area of a silicon photomultiplier. So you can see here that this tiny silicon photomultipliers are gathering light from the entire area um, that is being covered by these dichroic filters and waveguides, which guide the photons to the silicon PM. So there are a number of these per module, um, and some of them are sensitive to UV light and some of them are sensible to, sensitive to visible light. Now, this is important because uh, the cathode is actually covered with wavelength shifting reflective foils. Um, you can see here a lot of the cathode is covered in, in black protective covers, but this here you can see uh, the wavelength, wavelength shifting foil. And this is important because the SBND photon detection system is located behind the wire planes. You can see here, um, this was a test install that we did of, of, a, of a box and you can see um, how it's, it's sitting here looking towards the cathode. Now, because of the short Rayleigh scattering length um, of VUV photons in argon, um, the amount of light that you would collect that you will collect from the light detection system that's sitting behind the wire planes decreases steadily as you go towards the cathode, which is why it's very important that the reflective foils at the cathode um, allow us to get a more uniform coverage. So the scintillation light, the primary scintillation light will be reflected off of the cathode and visible light has a much longer Rayleigh scattering length. And so that light will reach the, reach the photon detection system, which, which is over here. And that the detection of both reflected light and primary scintillation light will give an improved total light yield. Um, and also importantly, a much more uniform light collection across the detector. And something that I think is quite exciting is that the difference um, at trigger time between VUV and visible light contributions could be determined to, to uh, it could be used to determine the position in the drift detection at the, the time of the trigger. So, um, so this granularity uh, is very important for, for, for the SBND physics uh, for a surface detector. It allows us to, to um, improve the cosmic ray rejection, which is quite important. So as I mentioned, uh, SBND PDS offers both physics and R&D. 
opportunities. It's the first time that XR Pukas and uh, PMTs will be in, a, in direct comparison in the neutrino beam. Um, and the current status for those is that XR Pukas are currently being assembled um, at Fermilab and the installation will happen after the TPC is complete. So, in, in, um, so the final two things that I wanted to mention is that the field cage installation is happening as we speak and the detection construction will complete this summer um, and the TPC will be moved to the SBND building um, and we have data taking which will start beginning in 2023. So um, exciting times ahead for SBND. Um, so please stay tuned for the updates and first results. Fabulous, only 20 seconds over time. Uh, questions from the audience? Okay, if no questions, then of course I've got questions. Um, how are you guys doing in the era of COVID? Um, one of it's, it's always an exciting set of challenges. How has assembly been happening? Has there been work remotely? How is it being brought? Can you comment on that? So um, there have been, we've, so I, I traveled to Fermilab for a longer period. So I've just got back from Fermilab actually. And it was challenging, it was particularly challenging to start with because we had to work at a distance. And when you're, when you can't hand a wrench to somebody, it's very hard. But after in the post vaccination era, um, it's much easier because we're allowed to work at close proximity. And you'll notice in this picture, we're all wearing masks, um, which is one of the requirements at Fermilab. And it, it's difficult, but it's certainly possible. Um, yeah. But actually, one of the things that's been very hard um, is getting materials. So purchasing of things has slowed us down quite a lot. We lost time on that. That's been something we've been struggling with for the near detector upgrade for TDK. It's been a big pain. Any questions? Otherwise, I've got more. <laughs> but it's nice to hear other voices than mine. Okay, uh, one other uh, question I had was, tell me a little bit about the R&D opportunities that you see here. What do you see as being developed that is gonna feed into future experiments like Dune or is just interesting from an R&D standpoint? So one of the one of the key things is is the photon detection system. So with having a very established device, um, the PMT right next to an Arapuka device um, in a neutrino beam, it it gives us the opportunity to have a direct comparison of what neutrino signals look like with both of these. And since Arapukas are a chosen technology for Dune, this is going to be something that's quite important. Um, and similarly with the reflector foils, uh, because they haven't been used, well, it's going to be one of the first times that they're used. Um, so yeah, this is this is one of the big things that I'm excited about. I'm also, I'm as I briefly mentioned, I'm also excited about the fact that with the sensitivity to the um to the visible light and the the UV light, um we might be able to develop triggers that can tell us quite exciting things about where in the detector the event's happening, um, which, yeah. Has yeah I, hadn't, I hadn't appreciated that. So that is very exciting. Thank you again very much for your talk. Uh, give her a, a clap. And then we would like to move on to our next speaker, uh, Jean Wilson at King's College London. I'm excited to hear about new Snow Plus status and results. Okay, thank you. Just find the right slides. Okay, do you see that full screen now? Looks good. All right, well, thank you very much for the chance to talk at this conference, even though it's not in person. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about Snow Plus and I'd just like to acknowledge that there's a lot of input from a lot of members of the collaboration into these slides. So thank you to everybody for that. Um, so what is Snowplast? It's a multi-purpose liquid scintillator detector. It's basically a reinvention of the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory, which um, used D2O as a detecting medium. And it's been upgraded to use scintillator as the detecting medium, which means it gives access to much lower energies. 
and with that it gives a new physics program. So the main goal and the main focus of SNOWPLAS is to search for neutrinos double beta decay using tellurium-130 as the isotope. But because we've got a very low en energy threshold, low background detector, we can also do a lot of other physics, including measurements of solar neutrinos down to low energies, um, measurements of oscillations of reactor antineutrinos and the flux of geo antineutrinos. Um, and we'll also be live to supernova bursts and therefore the astrophysics that that involves. And I will mention another measurement of invisible nucleon decay during this talk. And there's a number of other measurements that I don't have time to mention here. So this is an overview of the SNOWPLUS detector. It's two kilometers underground in Snow Lab. Um, the main bulk of the detector is this 12 meter diameter acrylic vessel that holds the detecting medium, which will be 780 tons of liquid scintillator. And that is where we'll load our isotope for the double beta decay search. Um, Around the detector, we have seven kilotons of ultra pure water as shielding, and therefore we have this rope net to counteract the buoyancy of the lighter scintillator in this volume. And um, we see the signal with around 9,300 PMTs that are mounted here in the water and looking inwards. Um, so I'm going to step through the timeline. We initially started um, the experiment way back in 2016, and our first data set I'd like to talk about is the water phase data. So first of all, we filled the acrylic vessel with just pure H2O, and we took two data sets with that. The first we've already published results on, and the second data set of 190 live days, we are finalizing the analysis of now. So the reason why it's really useful to analyze water in the detector is it's a simple detector and we can really study some of the components of the detector that are not going to change when we add the scintillator. So namely the acrylic vessel, the ropes, the outside water and the PMTs, which we all expect to contribute some level of natural radioactive background, but we don't expect it to change when we put the scintillator in. So we can measure them now and have a good constraint on them. And that's basically what we did with the water data, these plots here just show the events observed against the position in the detector given as radius cubed, where one here is the acrylic vessel, so it's weighted by the acrylic radius. And u dot r is basically a measure of the direction of the event, so the dot product of the radial vector and the direction of the event. So we can identify in this phase space some boxes that are sensitive to specific signals, so the PMT backgrounds down here, the external water up here, and the acrylic vessel and ropes here, and backgrounds in the internal water on the left. And we compare these with our expectations for Monte Carlo. Um, and the good news is that we found that our data was actually lower than our initial expectations. Um, and we fitted out the scale factors and assessed that we should see 0.9 events per year from all of these backgrounds combined in our double beta decay region of energy region of interest. Um, so that's a good measurement, which we're very pleased with. Um, in addition to the backgrounds from the water phase, we also produce various physics results. So the ones that have already published are a measurement of the solar neutrino flux, uh, limits on invisible nucleon decay. And also we showed um, that we can measure neutrons in pure water with about 50% efficiency for triggering, which is pretty good given that the neutrons only produce 2.2 MeV of energy. Um, so we're now working on improvements to these papers with our extra 190 days of water data. Um, so there will be a new solar flux and spectrum down to lower energies coming out soon. And there will be new limits um, on, on the nucleon decay modes. And because we can see these neutrons, we're working on a measurement of reactor antineutrinos in the water detector. So this would be sort of a technical breakthrough to show that we can detect antineutrinos in a pure water detector like this. Um, and that's well in progress. Uh, so now I'd like to move on to the scintillator filling. So these images just show some of the purification and filling systems. You'll notice that they're very condensed because space is tight in a mine. Um, so it's a big challenge to make these fit in the space available. Um, and on the right here, I just show our scintillator is linear alkyl benzene. And we dope that with two grams per liter of PPO, which is a floor to enhance the light yield we expect out of the detector. 
Um, so we ship the scintillator underground in rail cars and we purify it in our underground purification systems. And every batch that we put into the detector is QA'd to make sure that it meets the optical um, properties we need. Um, and this part is just showing that we see very good visible clarity of the scintillator. Um, above this line is the PPO absorption peak. So above that, it's very pure. And in fact, the light yield we were measuring is in excess of the standards that we set. So that is good news. So that's the scintillator. Um, unfortunately, due to COVID, we ended up pausing the filling of the scintillator for a long period in 2020 when we didn't have access to the lab. And that meant that we took uh, about seven months of data with the detector half full, about 47% full, which is 365 tonnes of scintillator in the detector. And this had a lower PPO doping level than the two grams per litre we expect, which means that the light yield is a bit lower. Um, but nonetheless, it was a very stable period because nobody was in the lab doing anything with the detector. So we took the chance to calibrate what we had. We deployed some calibration sources in the external water so that we could see the events within the scintillator. And uh, we observed about 300 photoelectrons per MeV for this scintillator. And this plot just shows various different energy calibration sources um, and the energy response. But importantly, we could also measure the scintillator backgrounds during this period by tracking the fast coincidence of bismuth polonium in the uranium and thorium decay chains. We can get an idea of how much um, of these backgrounds is in the detector. So this plot shows the time difference between the initial um, bismuth decay and the following polonium decay, um, which fits well to the um, time half-life of the decay for the 214. And this shows the number of decays over time. So as we were filling the detector, we did introduce some radon into the detector, but we see it clearly decaying away with this 3.8 days half-life. And what we do is we fit out this exponential and a flat constant component. And the parameters of that constant component give us an indication of the uh, sort of supported rate of uranium and thorium within the detector, which is at about the level of 10 to the minus 17, 17 grams per gram scintillator. And this is below the requirements that we need for the neutrinoless double beta decay search. So basically what we can do with this pure scintillator data is perform a kind of double beta target out analysis. So we're looking at the detector with everything except the tellurium in there. And we can look at the backgrounds in the region of interest where we would expect our double beta decay signal. Um, a quick mention of the other physics that we can do with the scintillator um, first. So we've looked at boronate solar neutrinos in the partial fill data. Um, so this is a statistics limited data set because it was only seven months and it was only a half fill detector, but uh, fitting out the signal in red in the background, we did fit out a uh, flux for the boronate solar neutrinos, which is consistent with um, other measurements, which is nice to see. Um, and we've also started an anti neutrino measurement in this um, partial fill data. So you can pull out the anti neutrino signals easily because inverse beta decay gives you a timing coincidence. And it's interesting for us to look at anti neutrinos at Snow Plus because. There is some tension in the um, delta m squared one two between the Kamlan results and the solar global neutrino fit. And if you put in the different preferred delta m squared values, you get quite a different spectral shape for Snow Plus just due to where our reactors are and the baselines to Snow Plus. So this means we've got good sensitivity to distinguishing these scenarios. Um, so we start now and we will build up statistics for this measurement. And of course, we're live for supernova as soon as we've got scintillator into the detector and part of Snooze One. Um, okay, so this is where we are now at the uh, end of 2021, 20, start of 2022. We have the detector full of scintillator and we're just topping up the level of the PPO to the full two grams per litre um, uh, fluor rating. Um, and we expect to finish that very shortly. Um, I just, if I've got time, I'll just mention very briefly that because we have been running the detector with a lower floor level than um, the final one, it means that the scintillator response is slower 
and it gives us a capacity to look for um, uh, directionality in the scintillator, which is the holy grail for rejecting solar neutrino backgrounds. If you can use the initial Cherenkov light to get the direction of the electron, you can distinguish solar events from other events that just produce isotropic light. And there's some indica indications that this is possible from the uh, low loading scintillator. You can see in this paper here. Okay, so I'll move on to the main analysis, which is the double beta decay analysis. Um, and the main reason for doing this is that it only occurs for Majorana neutrinos with a rate proportional to the mass of the neutrino. So it will answer some of these questions that are unanswered about neutrino nature. And the experimental signature that we're looking for is uh, emission of two electrons with the exact Q value of this decay. So you get a peak at a precise energy on top of the end of the continuous spectrum of the two neutrino double beta decay. And the strategy for SNOW Plus is that we have a very big detector. So we have high statistics. We can put lots of tellurium in it and we just shield through fiducialization. And we can purify that scintillator and we can load the tellurium in stages. So that means that we can make signal out measurements and measurements with different levels of scintillators so we can really understand the backgrounds. Um, and the Q value of the tellurium is high. So it gets us away from a lot of the natural radioactivity. And we have this method that works to load the tellurium into the detector. So the initial loading will be 0.5% natural tellurium by weight. Um, but what we're really trying to do is develop a, an approach and prove that it's scalable and affordable to get higher levels of isotope and therefore push towards the normal hierarchy sensitivity in the future. So these plots I'll go through quickly so I have time to show the results are just the purification plants for loading in plan and in actuality underground. And our target purification levels are given here. And this plot shows the expected background projections in a double beta decay region of interest, that energy region where we expect to see the signal. So we're dominated by the solar neutrinos, um, which as are well measured already, but hard to turn the sun off. The internal uranium and thorium backgrounds, we've already measured for the scintillator and the purification plant um, should achieve these levels for the tellurium component. We've already measured the external gamma backgrounds coming in, so we know that they are well constrained. And we can control the background of the two neutrino double beta decay by having an asymmetric region of interest. And our cosmogenic backgrounds we expect to be low because our isotope has been cooling underground for several years. Plus we can do some cool analysis with multi-site rejection to distinguish between single site energy deposits and beta gammas, which look a little different. So this is the projected spectrum that we would expect to see just in energy. Um, this is showing a 100 milli electron volt signal would look like on top of our backgrounds. Um, we would actually conduct a full likelihood analysis where we take into account um, radius and the multi-site discriminators as well as these distributions in energy. And we expect to achieve a sensitivity of half-lives greater than two times 10 to the 26 years with about three years of data. And that would put us about here in terms of our sensitivity to neutrino mass, which is comparable and com competitive with measurements from Camland and uh, Corey and Gerda. Um, but as I say, the idea that we can get more isotope in, we're proving methods to load additional isotope into the detector up to a few percent, means that we envisage a future phase of SNOW+. Uh, this is shown here for 3% loading, um, which would allow us to push well into the inverted hierarchy region. Um, and I should also highlight the fact that it's very important to measure with different isotopes. So um, Camland is leading the way with the xenon measurements, but obviously Snowplus will be with tellurium. So this is very important given the uncertainty with the different matrix elements. Okay, so I've run out of time, but I can leave you with my summary slide and an image of the Snowplus collaboration the last time we had a meeting in person. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, questions from the audience?
I've got questions. <laughs> so um, uh, tell me a little bit about the scintillator aging. Um, it's my understanding that, you know, you're going to have to run this for a long time. You've done really good quality control. How do you monitor that with time? Is that just done through calibration or? Uh, yes, calibration. I mean, we have we have backgrounds that are in the in the scintillator. Um, uh, think things like uh, low energy backgrounds that produce alphas and things like that. And we will see we see the peaks of them so we can see whether they move around with time. So we, we pretty much have a day-by-day day monitor. We've also got, uh, well, we have calibration sources that we can deploy um, when we want to do a really precise um, measure. Although we're, you know, that's, that's <laughs> there's risks of deploying calibration sources in case you bring backgrounds into the detector. So that's got to be very carefully thought out. And we also have um, light injection sources as well, which will help us understand like optical quality and things which, you know, point light across the scintillator, but you, you don't put anything in the scintillator in order to do that calibration, so it's unobtrusive. So we, we should be able to monitor it pretty well. No, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Uh, John Wilson, go for it. Uh, so you mentioned the buoyancy and also having the, the ball only partially filled. Do you have to reduce the water uh, when it's partially filled with, I, ass I assume, air? uh in order to avoid snapping the ropes yeah so we we the rope tensions are adjustable and it was always in the plan that we would adjust the tensions as we filled because the plan was always to put the scintillator in the top take the water out the bottom and so we've got two holes on it we can adjust the tensions in the ropes and we can also raise and lower the water level in the cavity outside as well so that they're, they're carefully monitored there's slow control that's constantly monitoring the rope tensions to make sure that we're not we're not going to snap them. And they do also stretch over time. I guess that that was always accommodated in the model. Okay, great. Uh, any other questions? I've got one more fast one, maybe. I thought it was really interesting that you mentioned on page eight that you're going to be able to push to a lower threshold for some of the uh, presumably solar neutrino physics. And I was trying to un just understand how that works relative to the, you know, the massive amount of data from snow and other experiments. So can you comment on just how you're getting to a, is it the, that just that you've got the scintillator and now you're pushing to a new energy threshold? Yeah. Kind yeah. I mean, with the scintillator, the backgrounds are, you know, there's not much above 2.5 MeV really in the detector. So with snow and I guess super K also because it's, um, uh, Cherenkov, it's hard to get below about 5 MeV. Um, your systematics and your backgrounds really shoot up there. Um, so just naturally, because you've got so much more light from the scintillator, you can get down, you know, another couple of MeV, which means that you're looking at the, the low energy end of the solar boronate spectrum where we expect it to turn up because of the um, oscillation. Um, uh, but the problem is that we're looking only at elastic scattering events. So we don't have the same um, energy mapping between the initial neutrino and the measured electron as we did have in snow in the charge current measurement. So it, it's, it's still hard to have much sensitivity because things get washed out by the elastic scattering measurement, but we can measure uh, energy deposits down to about 2.5 MeV. Yeah, still good stuff. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Great talk. Thank you. Uh, let's move on to next. Our next speaker is, and apologies for not checking how to pronounce your name properly, uh, Renier Wanke from University of Mines. Please go ahead. Yes. Hi, Ken. This is Wing Chang. Uh, let me share my screen. Oh, I did it wrong. Let's try I that thought, again. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I thought I was later. You were later. I did this wrong. Okay. <laughs> okay. Wei Shang Gu from Brookhaven National Lab. Please tell us about exciting results from the microneutrino cross section. Thanks. Um, okay. Uh, can everybody see my screen? The full yes. screen size. Okay. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, today I'm very glad to uh, be reporting the recent neutrino cross section results on behalf of the microphone collaboration. Uh, you can hear more about microboom from my colleagues in this or other session.
So um, liquid argon time projection chamber is one of the key technologies for current and uh, future neutrino oscillation uh, um, accelerator-based neutrino oscillation experiments, such as the short baseline neutrino program and the deep underground neutrino experiment. A good understanding of the neutrino argon cross-section is critical in reducing systematic uncertainties to reach desired precision of these uh, measurements. Um, for this talk, I'm going to talk about microboom experiment, which is the first de detector in the short baseline neutrino program. Since Nicola has introduced the uh, liquid TPC uh, in detail, so I will be brief on uh, on the on the principle for the liquid TPC. So it, basically, liquid TPC is a fully active tracking calorimeter through detecting ionization charges with uh, exquisite position resolution and the scintillation, scintillation light with good timing resolution. The ground TPC can detect a neutrino um, argon interaction in three dimension with excellent energy resolution. Particle identification can be done for both leptons and hadrons with topologies and energy deposition uh, information per unit length. This plot shows a candidate event of the neutral current interaction with multiple protons, one neutral pion, and a possibly a charged pion. At the center of the microboom detector is a 85-ton liquid argon TPC sitting on the booster neutrino uh, beamline, which has a mean neutrino energy of about uh, 0.8 GB and more than 99% of the uh, muon neutrinos and anti neutrinos. Oops, I, I realized I, I forgot to, to enable my uh, video. Okay, so um, additionally, the main injector neutrino beamline is providing an eight degree off axis neutrino flux of about 4% of electrons, uh, electron neutrino and anti neutrinos at microboom. The two neutrino beamlines allow us to measure cross sections for both neutrino, a muon neutrino and electron neutrino, which are crucial for precision measurements of muon neutrino to electron neutrino appearance of oscillation. Leveraging liquid argon TVC's excellent tracking calorimetry capability, microboom measures both inclusive and exclusive neutrino argon cross sections. Good understanding of charged current inclusive neutrino cross section and argon, where only the outgoing lepton is required, is important since it is the main channel in wideband beam neutrino oscillation experiments. At the same time, good understanding of exclusive neutrino cross-section where the hydron final states are identified is important to guide the development of event generators in building models of the underlying uh, reaction mechanisms. In the next a few slides, let me quickly review previously reported cross-section results from microboom. Using booster neutrino beam, microboom made the first measurement of muon neutrinos charged current inclusive double differential cross section on argon in terms of muon's momentum and the, the muon angle. The result shows a model over prediction in high momentum and the most forward going muon angular beam, where the nuclear nuclear uh, nuclear nuclear correlation is a possible explanation for this over prediction. Using neutrino beam from the main injector, a total cross section is measured for electron neutrino and anti neutrinos charged current inclusive interaction on argon. In this work, Microboom successfully demonstrated the charged current electron neutrino selection and the reconstruction in the surface liquid argon PPC. On the exclusive end, a first measurement of the flux integrated cross section of the muon neutrino charged current single pi naught production on argon uh, was carried out. 
also a first measurement of the muon neutrinos charged current cosy elastic like differential cross section on argon was made at a microphone with the requirement of only one proton and one muon in the final state a more significant model over prediction is observed compared to the uh, CC inclusive measurement. Another exclusive differential cross section with the signature of one muon, no pion, and at least one proton above a momentum threshold of 300 MeV, commonly referred to as a CC NP zero pi channel, has also been measured for the first time. For this channel, the differential cross section at low proton momentum region is sensitive to the nuclear effects such as the uh, final state interaction and the 2P2H effects. Similar to the inclusive and the CCQE light measurement, a model over prediction was also observed at the most forward going muon angle. Now, uh, let me report the new cross-section results from microbe. In this round of results, Microbone has significantly improved the detector res response in both the event reconstruction and the simulation. An advanced 2D deconvolution technique, considering the long-range induction effect, uh, leads to unprecedentedly clear images. An improved detector simulation, including such long-range induction effect, leads to much better beta Monte Carlo agreement. These advancements lead to significantly reduce the detector related to systematic uncertainties, which are evaluated with alternative detector modeling simulations. Besides of the improved detector modeling, we also upgraded our neutrino interaction model from Gini version two to version three with much better modeling of the underlying physics process through fitting to T2K's um, new mu CC pionized data at a similar energy range. Four key parameters that is related to the CCQE axial mass, RPA suppression, and the 2P2H models are determined. Um, in this update, we did not use microboom uh, data to avoid the potential bias in double fitting the microboom data in the subsequent analysis. While the forward going method was used to report the previous cross section results, in this round, we report unfolded cross section re results. Here, unfolding is a mathematic technique that extracts the underlying true distribution from the recall space distribution given the proper modeling of the response matrix. For the detailed unfolding procedure, we choose a regularization with the form of a winner filter. This choice automatically maximize the signal to noise ratio without any free parameter. Our definition of the cross-section with respect to the nominal neutrino flux naturally address, addressed a recent concern in evaluating neutrino flux shape uncertainty. Additionally, the exact winner filter is reported and can be applied on the model calculations for an improved data Monte Carlo comparison. For the inclusive muon neutrino charged current measurement, we have an improved event selection with about 68% efficiency and 92% purity. In this work, we extracted neutrino energy dependent inclusive muon neutrino charged current cross section. The main challenge of this work is to validate the modeling of the response matrix used in the unfolding procedure. Well, the key is to verify that uh, the modeling of the undetected missing hydronic energy. We overcome this challenge by leveraging the simultaneous measurement of lepton energy and the visible hydronic energy with a conditional constraining procedure. The back end formula then for the conditional constraining procedure is same as another 
famous algorithm called Gaussian process regression. A measurement of one vector variable leads to a constraint of the phase space in, a, in another correlated variable. This is a model correction on both the mean and the variance with uh, auxiliary data sidebands. Here, the comparison between data and the, and the Monte Carlo uh, and the model prediction of the reconstructed hydronic uh, energy uh, constrained by lepton energy measurement and the neutrino flux uh, can be sensitive to the modeling of the missing hydronic energy, given that the overall energy conservation. Well, there is a data access at the low, uh, at the re low reconstructed hydronic energy before applying any constraint from the uh, lepton measurement. An excellent data Monte Carlo agreement is achieved after applying the constraint of muon kinematics measurements. With the constraint, a significant reduction in the overall systematic uncertainty is re reduced at the low hydronic uh, energy region from 20% to 5%. This stringent model validation shows no signs of the missing, mismodeling of missing hydronic energy. With the overall model validated, we extract muon neutrinos inclusive charge current total cross-section as a function of the true neutrino energy. The unfolded cross-section uh, reflects the observed difference between data and the Monte Carlo central uh, prediction in the reconstructed uh, neutrino energy distribution as expected. Besides the energy dependent total cross section, we also extract the first time the differential cross section as a function of the energy transfer for argon. This, uh, the comparison with various predictions from different generators on the market shows good separation power. Among them, Jibu's central prediction gives best agreement at low energy transfer for argon, likely from a better modeling of the 2P2H effect. Similarly, in this round, the electron neutrino inclusive uh, charged current measurement from NUMI is improved from, uh, with a better event selection. The improved event selection allows us to extract the differential cross-section as a function of electron or positron's energy and, uh, and ang uh, angle with unfolding techniques. Beyond these uh, measurements, there are more ongoing uh, analysis at microphone, including a 2D differential cross-section uh, for the charged current uh, pi on S, uh, um, uh, zero pi NP channel. Uh, as well as the uh, uh, charged current there are uh, zero pi 2p channel, which is presumably sensitive to the 2p2h effect, and uh, uh, lambda lambda no, uh, lambda zero production measurement, which is driven by the anti neutrino, and the NC um, elastic scattering measurement uh, the, with the momentum transfer as low as 0.1 GV square, which is sensitive to the strange quark contribution to the proton spin. So it brings me to my short summary. Understanding of the neutrino argon cross-section is vital for liquid argon TVC-based precision neutrino oscillation um, experiments. Microboom has produced the numerous neutrino argon cross-section measurements, including the electron neutrino and the muon neutrino, uh, inclusive neutron, uh, in, inclusive channel and the exclusive uh, measurements. Uh, Microboom will be the only high statistical uh, neutron argon observatory before SPND is online. Also, the new validation method of neutron energy modeling enables the energy dependent inclusive muon neutron charged current cross section. The new result shows good separation power of the model predictions from different generators. Please. Uh, stay tuned for more exciting results from my group. Thanks. Thank you very much. So questions from the audience? If not, you know me, I've got questions. <laughs> so um, 
Um, I, the two things that make me uh, <laughs> interested and skeptical are how your choice of unfolding can affect how you extract models and also how you're really verifying what the procedure you talked about to try to estimate the missing hadronic energy. Have you done dedicated validations of either of those things where you're, you put in you know, possibly an extreme model and see that you're able to return the correct values and, and really testing all aspects of the procedure? Like uh, we, we call them on TDK fake data studies. And so I'm curious if you use pseudo data with really grossly different models and show that your procedure can extract the underlying true parameter correctly. Um, yes, we have done um, numerous uh, fake data studies, including uh, for the unfolding pr procedure, uh, we have done the uh, try the extraction of the cross section with the fake data, uh, which is built on different uh, underlying models and the extraction of the cross-section um, agrees with the underlying model. And uh, uh, for the valid model validation, energy modeling validation, we also have done the fake data um, by either changing the underlying model or changing the energy uh, fraction of energy that has been allocated to protons so that we can mimic the a variation of the uh, proton uh, inelastic uh, scattering um, to give us a variation of the missing energy. You know, all these, um, uh, th these changing in, in the model shows that our validation method is sensitive to the, to the underlying model. So yeah, so both of your questions. Yes, um, I will um, thoroughly enjoy reading your papers to hear more about that. Uh, and, and now I'm, I think I've been greedy. Are there other people that have wonderful questions for a wonderful speaker? Oh no, I have more questions. Yeah. <laughs> I, thank you so much for putting Newt on this plot. Um, I, I want to confirm, so one first is a comment that we struggle with on TDK, which is it's really helpful in parallel to having the, the model a full number, but also having, you know, give me some more details about what the models are. And so for all of your slides, the version of Newt is in fact this version, which should be, we have both an, a spectral function and a local Fermi gas. Can you tell me which one you were using for this, these comparisons? Um, I put for the Newt model. So it is, I have to check the, our tech node before I can, I can tell you the details, but I, I put the, the Newt number, the version yeah, number. Yeah. But, but much like both Newt and Genie have multiple configurations. And so I think it's really helpful when we, I think you put in some really nice conclusions for this really great set of data that you've got. But I think that'll also help us better understand what some of these comparisons mean. Um, and the, the final thing I was also sort of curious about was, it's really great you tuned to TDK data. I'm a TDK collaborator, so I've got bias. Um, but can you tell us a little bit more about what parameters you tuned and what like even in generic feature shapes? Uh, you, or, you mean in our Gini2 model? Yeah, yeah. Like, were you uh, modifying the Q-squared distributions so, uh, for and which features? So it is based on the Gini version 3. So um, just to remind people what has been updated in this version 3. So uh, the in the version, new version Gini, the, there are some uh, models has been updated. For example, the local Fermi gas model of the nuclear ground state and the Valencia, uh, Valencia treatment of the CCQE and 2P2H. Um, but beyond that, um, we, we also tune the four key parameters uh, for this Gini version three. Uh, one is the CCQE axial mass. Um, then the other is the RPA suppression, the parameter for the RPA suppression and two parameters that is related to the 2P2H amplitude and the shape shaping. Uh, so these four parameters has been um, has been tuned through a fitting to T2K's uh, data from 2016. Yeah, that's that's super interesting. And th those were exactly the, the similar categories of parameters that T2K also does tuning to. So that's that's great. Thank you for this uh, wonderful work. Yay. Let's hear now from <laughs> maybe I have the right speaker order. Um, Rainier uh, Blanque, hopefully. Yeah. I, I hope so. I hope so. And I hope I said your name right from <laughs> University of Green. Um, there's this one here. And uh, let me go to full screen.
Okay, I hope you can can see the slides. Well, I can see the slides, uh, and yep, I'm yes, seeing uh, the change. first one. So that's the first one. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, good afternoon to the UK, and uh, good evening to most of the rest of the Europe. And uh, I don't know to China. Probably good night. I I, uh, I don't know. I'm uh, really <laughs> I'm happy not not uh, not to be there at the moment, but. Um, uh, yeah, let's uh, switch gears and uh, of the topic and also of the experiment uh, or the type of the experiment. So I will report about the search for heavy neutral leptons um, in uh, k on decays, in charged k on decays with the NA62 experiment. Um, I will first introduce, say a few words about the heavy neutral leptons, uh, then introduce the NA62 experiment at CERN and uh, then present uh, the searches for the heavy neutral leptons in, uh, in the chaos decays, and also some other searches for uh, invisible particles or for, for, or for special decays, um, also of chaos to, to neutrinos. Um, yeah, uh, as you know, the standard model is very successful, but it fails to explain uh, neutrino masses, the baryon asymmetry, and also, of course, the dark matter in the universe. And uh, one of the proposed extensions is the so-called neutrino minimal standard model extension, uh, which was proposed about 15 years ago, and uh, introduces three right-handed, three additional right-handed sterile neutrinos, uh, which may actually mix with the classical active neutrinos via this uh, matrix, uh, which you see on the right side, uh, which is essentially um, yeah, uh, it's a normal uh, BMNS matrix, uh, but just with uh, additional three uh, <clears throat> sterile flavors. And uh, then you have a seesaw mechanism. And the interesting thing is in this model that uh, the lightest uh, heavy neutral lepton mass, uh, the, uh, the lightest heavy neutrino mass is uh, on the order of 10 keV. So it's not really very heavy. And for that, it's a natural dark matter candidate. The other two masses should be on the order of 100 MeV to 100 GeV, so these are much, much heavier. Uh, but the slight one is, is the interesting one, and that's uh, what we are going to look for. The Yukawa couplings of these neutrinos are very small in the range of 10 to the minus 11 to 10 to the minus 6. Um, yeah, how can we look for them? Actually, first of all, we have to produce them, and uh, they could be produced in, in uh, decays of, of uh, particles of uh, in this case of charged kaons, and um, the rate should be proportional to the mixing parameter, uh, this respective mixing parameter UL4. Um, here I'm only considering one uh, additional lepton, but it can of course easily expand it to, to three flavors, and uh, <clears throat> and uh, so it would be proportional to the UL4 square parameter. Uh, since we are looking uh, for k on the case, we can only observe masses up to half a GeV, uh, which is the mass of the k on. And the master formula is very simple. So you have uh, the branching fraction of the decay into a, a lepton, a charged lepton, and the heavy neutral lep heavy nu neutrino or heavy neutral lepton is a branching fraction of the corresponding standard model decay into a normal neutrino. Uh, multiplied with a, a kinematic factor and multiplied with the uh, PMNS matrix or uh, um, extended PMNS matrix element UL4 squared. This kinematic factor uh, for the muonic decay, which is the abandoned decay in, in, in case of the charged K on decays, uh, is of the order of one. However, if you look for the, the electronic decay, which is heavily suppressed in the uh, because of helicity suppression, then you have, um, in fact, uh, uh, an enhancement of the same amount, so which cancels the helicity suppression. So in the end, you are as sensitive to the electron channel as uh, to the to the muon channel, as you can see uh, on the right side. You see these uh, kinematic functions; these are pure kinematics, and uh, you see they are on the same order. Um, uh, one is uh, multiplied then with the branching fraction of k nu over k mu nu. And it means that, as I said before, that uh, your branching fraction is essentially just the, of the order of the mixing parameter itself. Uh, let's uh, 
briefly describe the experiment. So the NA62 experiment is located at CERN. It's at the CERN SPS, which is a, also used as a pre-accelerator for the LHC. Uh, it's not such a small experiment, but not really a big experiment either. And the main goal, in fact, is the measurement of the very, very rare decay of uh, the charged kaon to the charged pion and, and two neutrinos, which is on the order of 10 to the minus 11. So uh, what we have is a lot of kaon decays, obviously. And um, we are taking data since uh, uh, 2016, so three years before the uh, shutdown of CERN, of the CERN accelerators. And this year, uh, or actually last year now already, uh, we are start restarted data taking uh, with a little bit of a proof detector. But the data I will show are from the year 2016 to 18. This is a look into the detector. It's a fixed target experiment. Um, you see uh, from the back to the front. So you see uh, behind this concrete wall in the back, uh, you have the target, which is uh, about 250 meter upstream of, of, the, of the end of the detector. So this is a very long experiment. Uh, uh, and uh, you see it's, it's uh, however, compared to the LHC experiments, it's, it's, it's uh, relatively thin. Let's say it that way, and you see a spectrometer with a spectrometer magnet here and the rich detector, uh, which I will show a bit more in a sketch um, how it looks like. You see here uh, the whole experiment, um, where, which is, as I said, about 250 meter long. And uh, you have a target where you have uh, protons from the CERN uh, super proton synchrotron of 400 GeV over C. Um, uh, which hit a target, and these, uh, from this target, we have a secondary beam of charged particles selected at, at 75 GeV over C. And um, in fact, this is not a separated beam, so we don't have only kaons. In fact, there are only 6% kaons, um, but we have um, mostly pions and, and protons. Um, for that, we, we need uh, some sort of tagging of the kaon, and that we have here a K tag, which is a cedar detector is Cherenkov detector, uh, which uh, then uh, can tag the kaon, so 6% of the kaon in the beam. And we have also a beam tracker, which measures the, beam mo uh, the momentum of the single particles. And uh, they are coming with 750 megahertz. So uh, this, is, this is quite quite a big um, uh, challenge, was quite a big challenge to actually contract, construct this thing, uh, measure every particle, uh, the momentum to, to a percent or so. And um, then uh, we have a decay volume of about 60 meter length, um, where the particle hopefully decays. If it's a kaon, you uh, can have, a, for instance, a charged lepton and some invisible stuff, which usually, of course, is a normal neutrino. But we are looking for heavy neutral leptons. And, um, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, uh, if a pion decays, actually, we wouldn't see anything because of the of the um, low uh, phase space. So the muon would just travel along the beam line and we wouldn't see it. And then we have a lot of uh, anti uh, uh, veto detectors, anti counters here in blue shown also in the end, and, uh, and uh, photon detection, uh, a rich detector for particle ID, uh, muon veto calorimeters, and uh, all this kind of stuff. Uh, to have a very good particle ID and a very good, a very hermetic detector to also uh, have any uh, photons escaping uh, being detected or other particles escaping. The data, as I said, come from the years 2016 to 2018. And uh, in total, we have about uh, six times 10 to the 12 useful k on uh, which which were investigated. And uh, essentially, we have uh, two trigger streams which are used for the for the um, search for heavy neutral leptons. One is a normal trigger for the for the signal channel of pi plus nu nu bar, uh, which is essentially one track. Uh, we have features for photons and muons, and uh, uh, but not for electrons. So uh, this is used for the electronic channel. Since this is as a very low branching fraction, this is not a problem for the trigger. And so it's not downscaled. For the muonic channels, uh, we need to downscale. And that uh, we need uh, is, is a minimum bias trigger, which is downscaled by a factor of 400. So we only get 
uh, about uh, 400 of, of all the decays. Still, it's a lot because the muonic decay is, is the most uh, abundant decay of the charged kaon. Okay, let's have a look for the um, uh, heavy neutral electrons in the decays of, of K onto electrons and K onto to muons. And um, so the idea is, uh, is very simple. You are, uh, if, if you look for this heavy neutral electrons, which you won't detect because they're uh, supposed to be uh, more or less stable, at least stable enough to escape the detector. And, um, but what you can do is we measure the kaon momentum, we measure the lepton, the charge lepton momentum and build the uh, invariant mass between the two. And then we have the mass, invariant mass of the invisible particle um, or of the invisible state. Usually, of course, it would be zero because you would uh, expect a normal neutrino. If you have, however, a heavy neutral lepton, you would see a sharp peak in this uh, M square miss, in this spectrum of the missing mass squared. And uh, the selection reconstructions are fairly simple. You are, uh, as, as I say, you measure and uh, reconstruct the charged kaon, the charged lepton, match the two so that they have a common vertex. Uh, then you have a powerful particle ID, which uh, essentially um, has, has, has a background only on the order of 10 to the minus five um, to the muon and to the electron. And you're vetoing extra activity to make sure that no photons are that stuff escaped. And then if you look on the right side, but not completely right, just a half right side, let's say, uh, you see the search for the uh, heavy neutral lepton in, in the electronic channel. In yellow, you see the standard model DK, which is the helicity suppressed K on to E plus a neutrino. And you see we have millions of these decay, even though it's on the order of 10 to the minus five. Uh, and uh, then you have in, in green, you have, uh, the normal muonic decay with the muon decaying into electron, uh, which is actually suppressed by a good by the vertex resolution, since you have two kinks in the in the uh, in, in the topology, and then you have uh, some pi plus uh, which you are accidentally mistagging in the um, in the beam line, which uh, then decay also to electrons, which is of course also very rare, but you see this is a logarithmic scale. This is a very small background effect. And you see that the data over Monte Carlo uh, describes, uh, uh, is, is, is the, the data are described by the Monte Carlo very well. And, um, uh, and you don't see any, any sharp peak as you would expect for a heavy neutral lepton. On the right side, you see the same thing for the uh, muonic channel. There you have the, uh, of course, the very abundant K to mu, mu decay. And then on the right side, you have some tail also and, and some, some background also, uh, which you have to subtract. And also there, Delta and Monte Carlo agree very well and you don't see a, 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 a clear spike or anything. So now look for, um, Ah, um, yeah, these are the numbers uh, uh, on, the, on the lower left. Um, the number of kaons we use are uh, about uh, three times 10 to the 12 for the electronic channel because of the downscaling only 10 to the 10 for the muonic channel. And in the end for this yellow, in yellow shown standard model decays, we find uh, three and a half million of electron decays and uh, two and a half billion uh, or 2.2 billion for the muonic decay. So now um, search for heavy neutral leptons. You scan over these uh, over the bands where you in this in this region in the search region here and, and look for spikes in the in the um, in the uh, data Monte Carlo ratio. Obviously, there are no spikes, but you can then set limits and um, choose a window which slides over all the data in some certain step size. The step size is on the order of one MeV, so it's ra rather small. As you can see here, the, um, the whole range is about uh, 300, 400 MeV. And, um, and uh, the window size is adjusted to the resolution we had, which depends a bit on the on the uh, hypothetical mass we, uh, we are looking for, and um, is on the order also of, of MeV. Uh, and uh, that way we can set limits on uh, UE4 and UE or mu4 squared by just look uh, by just 
comparing the observed number and the expected number of events. And you see here for on the left side for the electronic channel, um, uh, you see here uh, uh, essentially the um, the expected upper limit, which is in, in the dashed line with the one in the two sigma bands in, in green and yellow. And you see one spike at about 346 MeV, Are which is- a, Can you uh, give us- oh, Okay, I'm almost, I'm almost done, yeah. Um, one spike here, which has a significance of 3.6 sigma, but uh, uh, accounting for the look also effect is just 2.2 sigma. For the k and a channel, we have no local significance above three sigma. This is a plot of the uh, searches, HNL searches, and you see that uh, in red, the electronic channels, and in, in dark blue, the, the muonic channels is uh, better uh, uh, than any other experiment so far, like at KEK, Triumph, and so on. And it is essentially the same range as this E949. Uh, which is, uh, however, at lower masses. Then uh, just one slide for the mu nu, mu -nu x decays, um, where we have the muon and three neutrinos, or muon neutrino and some scalar or vector particle, where you have not a spike, but a, but a, um, a broad distribution. So you look for just some enhancement over, over uh, the plot of, of the missing mass in the tail. And uh, of course, also there we don't find anything and we can set limits at uh, 10 to the minus six for the mu and three neutrinos and uh, upper limits on the scalar or vector particle X on the order of 10 to the minus five to 10 to the minus seven, depending on the mass. To conclude, uh, uh, NS62 has found the world best limits on the HNL mixing parameters. Uh, so UE4 and U mu4 so far, and the order of 10 to the minus 9 and 10 to the minus 8. And also has looked for this uh, other channels, uh, muonic channels with uh, some other particles. Um, uh, we have now, as I said, start, restarted data taking uh, for the full time up to lo the long shutdown three and four years. And uh, we are running now at a 30% higher beam intensity and, and want to collect about uh, five to 10 times more K-on decays. And also we would like to, uh, we plan to collect 10 to the 18th protons on target in, in so-called dump mode, uh, where we just dump the whole beam uh, and look for, uh, for anything which comes out after a huge block of iron. And uh, there we of course have also sensitivity for hand heavy neutral leptons. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wonderful information. I'm, I love these searches. I think they're great. Uh, do people have any questions? Uh, yes, good. Julian. Yes, uh, so if you go, uh, for example, to slide uh, 16, where you have this um, plot here of the K plus to mu plus um, to lepton on the left side of the plot, uh, which is not your search region, um, one sees quite a difference between uh, Monte Carlo and data, could you? But quite a difference is maybe a bit exaggerating, but you're right, uh, there is some difference. You see um, uh, the, the, the data is uh, 10 to the nine, right? Goes up to the 10 to the nine and the difference starts at about uh, uh, really to show up at 10 to the five. So there's four orders of thing just below. Um, and uh, there uh, we are relying a bit on the, um, on, on the um, on the modeling of the of, of really on, on the resolution. In fact, uh, you see that uh, in the region even down to ten to the two, the is is, is, is a difference is not that big. And this is accounted for in the search um, on the on the right side, um, where you have um, left uh, uh, the shape. There you have the shape. Um, clear, but you have left the um, uh, the normalization free for this. Okay, so it's basically just a bit misleading because you don't. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, exactly. thank you. You see, even on the right okay. side, uh, where this orange, uh, where, which is called non-Gaussian tail, which is actually um, uh, you see uh, taking part of this, which is not used on the left side. Okay. Um, Marco, did you want to add anything there? I just uh, thanks very much for the talk. Good to see you, Reiner. I uh, have 
uh, I have the same question. Uh, so the chair is lucky. Uh, we can. So, and, and if I can, as chair's prerogative, um, I, I would be interested in, and maybe we can talk more offline, uh, uh, Reiner, about the TDK results in, for um, the U mu E, uh, U mu uh, four coupling and U E four coupling. Um, I put the link in the window for people to enjoy and let's talk offline. Let's move on to our, our next speaker. Uh, Nick, would you please share? Coming sure, from MIT, yeah. who will talk to us about microboom. Sure. Um, I don't, uh, there we go. Now I've got permission. Okay, I think you can see my screen now. Yep, take it away. Oh, okay, thanks. Yeah, so I wanna thank the organizers for uh, inviting me. I'm gonna talk about uh, the first results from the microboom search for a low energy access on behalf of the microboom collaboration. And before I begin, I just wanna uh, give a quick shout out to the other microboom talks and posters here at Lepton Photon. Um, oh, one second, I guess it's taking a while to change slides. There we go. Uh, okay, so this talk is going to examine the mini boon anomaly. Um, so the mini boon anomaly is an excess of electron neutrino like events in a predominantly muon neutrino beam. Um, it's been tested now by the follow up micro boon experiment, uh, which you've heard about in this session. Um, it's the a liquid argon time projection chamber situated on the same beam line as mini boon. And today I'm going to present micro boon's first results exploring the nature of the mini boon low energy excess. Uh, so I'll start by talking about the mini boon anomaly in a bit more detail, and then I'll introduce the micro boon experiment and finally uh, talk about micro boon's first results. Uh, so the mini boon detector sits along the Fermilab booster neutrino beam line, which you can see here. Um, it's a uh, it's a roughly 800 ton uh, mineral oil Sharonkov detector um, that's about 500 meters from the beryllium target of the booster neutrino beam, uh, and the mini boon excess is an excess of electron like events. Uh, and in Mini Boon's uh, Sharonkov detector, electrons show up as these fuzzy Sharonkov rings uh, due to the electromagnetic showering nature of the uh, electron signature in the Sharonkov detector. Um, and there are some limitations that arise uh, from the detector medium in Mini Boon. Uh, so, one is that electrons and photons are actually indistinguishable. Um, both of them will induce an electromagnetic shower, and both will show up as this fuzzy uh, Sharonkov ring. Um, and the other limitation is that there's no hadronic information. Uh, so at the energies of the booster neutrino beam, roughly you know, hundreds of MeV to a GeV, um, protons are typically below the Sharonkov threshold in mineral oils, so you won't see them. Um, and uh, so keeping this in mind, I show here at the top uh, the latest results on the mini boon excess from the collaboration. Um, it now stands as a 4.8 sigma excess above the uh, predicted standard model background in the electron-like channel, as you can see by the data points here. Uh, the standard model prediction is shown in the stacked histogram, uh, where the green contribution here comes from intrinsic electron neutrinos in the booster neutrino beam that will undergo charged current scattering and create an electron. Um, but you can also see toward the lower energies um, an increase in uh, mis misidentified photon backgrounds, uh, and the largest of these being the pi naught misidentification shown in red. Um, so if one wants to uh, robustly test the mini boon anomaly, uh, one requires a detector capable of providing more detailed event by event information. Uh, and this is where microboon comes in. And so you can see microboon here, also along the booster neutrino beam line, situated about 70 meters in front of mini boon, uh, that you can see this image here of microboon being lowered into its, uh, its home at LARTF. Um, and microboon, uh, as has also been described in the session, is a liquid argon time projection chamber. I think this is now the third time LRTPCs are being described, so I'll just give a very brief review. On microboon, uh, neutrino will come in, and if it undergoes a charged current uh, scattering process, it will uh, uh, create charged particles in the final state, which will ionize argon atoms as they propagate through the detector. Uh, one can then drift these uh, free ionization electrons through an electric field to a series of wire planes and then use the uh, charge per time induced on each wire in these planes in conjunction with the known drift time of electrons in, uh, in the detector to create a 3D reconstruction of the path of these charged particles through the detector. Uh, so microboon is an 85 metric ton active mass, uh, LAR TPC. Uh, it achieves order millimeter or so spatial resolution, uh, specifically the wires in each plane are separated by about three millimeters. Uh, it has the ability to reconstruct hadronic activity because it uses ionization as a detection technique. 
Uh, it can achieve photon electron discrimination uh, because photons will travel a characteristic uh, distance about tens of centimeters before they pair produce an argon. So there will be a bit of a gap between a photon uh, electromagnetic shower and the neutrino vertex. Uh, it's made a number of important contributions to our understanding of LAR TPCs, uh, which I won't read out, but I list here. And this is important for uh, the future LAR TPC program uh, in the US. Um, and you can see a picture of an event display here in microboon where the neutrino will come in from the left, interact in the argon, and produce a number of charged particles in the final state. And just sort of to highlight the power of a large TPC, I want to direct your attention to the plots in the bottom right. Uh, these are event displays uh, for what one might see in a, an electron neutrino charged current uh, quasi elastic scattering event that creates an electron and proton in the final state. Uh, so in mini boon's Cherenkov detector, you would only pick up the fuzzy ring from the electron in that event is shown here. Uh, but in the microboon detector, you get a really clean image of a short, uh, highly ionizing proton track with a nice frag peak at the end, um, connected to an electromagnetic shower from the electron. So you get a lot more information in the LART TPC. Uh, so microboon has taken data from 2015 to 2021. Uh, we recently shut off the detector in October 2021. On um, the analyses covered today, uh, we'll consider the first seven E20 protons on target are roughly half of the full data set. Uh, so now I'll spend the rest of the time talking about Microboot's first results. Uh, so in our first results testing the low energy excess, uh, Microboot has developed three independent analyses that target electron neutrino final states, uh, testing whether the excess is due to an enhancement of electron neutrinos in the DNB. Uh, we have another analysis that has searched for an enhancement of neutral current delta to n gamma events. Um, uh, as an explanation for the excess. Um, I will note that Microboon has not yet performed a generic single photon search as the origin of the uh, mini boon excess, but this is in progress, so stay tuned on results from that in the near future. Uh, for the electron analyses, we've used what we call the simplified LEE model. Um, this is a physics agnostic model, um, completely phenomenological uh, description of an excess of low energy electron neutrino events that's based on the mini boon results. Uh, so what we do here is we take the mini boon observation and we unfold the uh, data over Monte Carlo excess under an assumption that it comes from electron neutrinos in the BNB to obtain a series of uh, low energy excess model weights as a function of the true neutrino energy. Uh, we can then apply these weights to the microboon simulation um, to get the, uh, the prediction for the LEE model um, in the uh, microboon detector itself. And uh, what's key is that this uh, LEE model is treated the same way for all three electron analyses. So they all use this unfolded model technique. Uh, so to give a bit more detail on the three electron neutrino searches, uh, we have a two body CCQE sample. Uh, this is a search looking for a very exclusive signal definition. It looks for electron neutrinos that create one electron and one proton in the final state from a charged current quasi elastic process. Uh, and this analysis leverages deep learning based reconstruction um, and uses two body scattering kinematics to isolate a pure sample of electron neutrino 1E1P events. We also have a pi on the sample, uh, which uses a semi inclusive uh, signal definition. Uh, it has two final states a 1E zero proton zero pi on channel and a 1EN proton uh, zero pi on channel, where N is greater than zero. This is a typo, sorry. So it requires at least one proton. And this leverages Pandora based reconstruction. And then finally, we have an inclusive sample, uh, which has a fully inclusive signal definition. Um, it looks for one electron and anything else in the final state, and it leverages wire cell-based reconstruction. Uh, so each of these uh, analyses has isolated a number of uh, muon neutrino-based sideband samples um, to validate the uh, analysis framework. Um, these, temp these samples tend to be higher energy, or sorry, higher to have higher uh, statistics because there are more muon neutrinos in the BNB in general. Uh, so I show, for example, that in the two-body analysis, the new mu CCQE one mu on one proton uh, um, sample, a new mu CC inclusive sample from the pi MS analysis, and then two samples from the inclusive analysis, a uh, general new mu CC sample, fully contained events, and uh, a similar sample, uh, but requiring one pi naught in the final state. Uh, and these new mu samples are important because um, and the BNB flux and the cross section of the new mu events in Markaboon are highly correlated with that of the electron neutrino events. Uh, so the uh, new E's and the BNB come from the same meson decay chain as the muon neutrinos, and the cross section is uh, the same up to kinematic factors. Um, and because these samples are highly correlated, uh, you can then use the new mu sample to perform a data driven constraint on the prediction and uncertainties 
uh, in the new E signal channel um, of each analysis. And this was talked about a bit uh, in the cross section talk in this section. Um, but just to give you an example of how this looks in the LEE analyses, I show here the breakdown of uncertainties in the 1E1P channel, um, where you have uncertainties from your flux model, the cross section model, the hadron reinteraction model. Uh, we have a detector, uh, detector systematics from our detector modeling and Monte Carlo statistical errors, uh, making up our total systematic error in the 1E1P analysis. And after we constrain uh, the 1E1P signal channel uh, with the observation in the new mu, 1E1P channel, uh, you can see that the systematic errors are reduced across all neutrino energies. Uh, each analysis then has a signal sample of electron neutrino like events. So I show here the 1E1P sample from the two body analysis, the inclusive analysis, 1E and anything else sample, and then the two pi on this analyses, the 1EN proton zero pi on and the 1E zero proton zero pi on analyses. Uh, the prediction from the Gini, um, uh, coming from the Gini event generator is shown in the stacked histogram uh, in each plot here. And the uh, simplified LEE model that I described earlier is shown as the red dashed line in each plot. And in general, um, sort of by eye, you can see that the data uh, tends, it seems like the data tends to prefer uh, the, uh, the Gini prediction rather than the simplified LEE model. I'll talk about this more soon. Uh, we've also looked at a number of other variables for these signal channels. So here I show plots of the uh, electron angle in each analysis. Um, and also being a large TPC, we have access to the hadronic information. So here I show the hadronic energy in each analysis, uh, except for the zero proton analysis as there are no hadrons in that analysis by definition. Uh, so like I said, uh, most anal or actually, if you, if you look back at the plots uh, from a few slides ago, most analyses observe a bit of a deficit of electron neutrino events at the lowest energies uh, compared to even the Gini level prediction, which means we're quite inconsistent with a mini boom like excess. Uh, this is exemplified in the plot in the bottom left here, um, where we show uh, in the lowest energy regions of each analysis, um, the observed events over the prediction without the LEE, so coming from the Gini um, event generator. And you can see in general, the data sits below uh, the gray line at 1.0, meaning we're sitting a little bit below the Gini prediction. And this means we're quite inconsistent with the LEE model, which is represented by the red lines at each plot. Um, I'll note that this is true for three of the four uh, new analyses, um, with the exception of the 1E zero proton zero pion analysis, which sits a bit above the uh, no LEE prediction. Um, but I will note that this is the least sensitive of the four analyses. Uh, one can also scale the LEE model by a signal strength parameter to place a limit on the electron neutrino contribution to the mini boon excess. And this is what's done in the bottom right plot. So in black, you can see the one and two sigma um, allowed regions on the signal strength scaling parameter in each analysis. Uh, compared to the expected sensitivity in red. And in general, you can see that most analyses, uh, with the exception of the zero proton analysis, are inconsistent with the signal strength scaling of one at the two to three sigma level. Um, so we can also, uh, I'll quickly cover the photons. So Mark has also uh, performed a Pandora-based search for an excess of neutral current delta to N gamma events. Uh, Mini Boon publications suggest that a scaling of about three uh, could be a good explanation for the uh, mini boon excess. And actually, this is the only photon uh, decay channel that's not constrained in situ by the mini boon experiment. Uh, so in micro boon, we look for the um, delta decay, delta radiated decays in a few different final states. So for example, in the one gamma one proton final state, uh, we look for a delta plus resonance to decay to a proton and a photon where we have a proton track with a Bragg peak and an electromagnetic shower from the photon separated from the proton but pointing back. And this gives us a sample uh, here, which you see in the bottom right, where the uh, yellow contribution is the Gini prediction for neutral current delta to N, uh, N gamma events. The yellow dashed line is the uh, scale, the LEE model, or that prediction scaled by a factor of about three, and the dominant background coming from neutral current one pi naught events. Uh, this analysis has also looked for a one gamma zero proton final state, um, but the more sensitive channel is the one gamma one proton. Um, I will uh, just mention the highlights of this slide. Uh, so the observation from this analysis is sitting a bit below even the Gini level prediction. Um, and this means that the uh, LEE model, or the scaling by a factor of 3.18, is ruled out at about the 95% confidence level. Uh, and I'll note that this analysis also actually performed, uh, obtains a world leading limit on the effective branching ratio uh, for this process at neutrino energies less than about one GeV. Uh, by more than an order of magnitude. So this is really quite an improvement in our measurement of neutral current delta radiative decays. 
Uh, so microboon's full first results uh, suggest that the mini boon excess is not primarily due to either low energy UE charged current interactions or neutral current delta to n gamma interactions. And so the question remains, uh, what else could explain the mini boon excess? Uh, the theory community has uh, been hard at work coming up with models that are a bit more exotic that can uh, provide a good explanation of the mini boon excess. So this is a non-exhaustive list, uh, but a sort of sample of models that produce different final states that can explain mini boon. Uh, so some produce electrons, some produce photons, and uh, some produce collimated E plus E minus pairs, all of which can reproduce the mini boon excess. On uh, here, I map, uh, we map some of those models to the final states that they would produce in the microboon detector. And I've just highlighted in yellow um, the final states that have already been proved by the first LEU results. Uh, so this is really the direction of microboon. Uh, we are going to start looking at more exotic BSM explanations of the mini boon excess. And if you're interested in more details, you can look at uh, Anissa's talk on Wednesday or Luis's poster, which was presented on Monday. Uh, so it looks like I'm out of time, but just to conclude, um, the recently released microboon results disfavor both uh, new e charged current interactions and neutral current delta to n gamma uh, decays as the primary source of the mini boon excess. Uh, but this is just the first phase of microboon and short baseline results uh, that will test an array of BSM explanations for the mini boon LEE anomaly. Um, so thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. And sorry for going a bit over time. Great, thank you very much. Uh, it was a, a fun tour through the microboon access studies and tests. Questions for our speaker? As usual, I've got questions. So something I'm trying to clarify about um, page 13, you have your unfolded model that is to try to just give you a sense of how the low energy excess changes. When I looked at this, this weight seems very, very large. It's, it looks like it's eating the entirety of the excess or is it, is, is it the full difference of just the new E component that you're scaling up, i.e. The, you know, the green components or are you actually also scaling everything including the photon backgrounds? The reason I'm asking is it, it helps me understand how I'm supposed to interpret this if you're just changing the new E component or if you're changing the, like the entire difference. Sure. Yeah, no, that's a good question. We're actually just changing the new E component uh, for the electron neutrino searches. So you can think of it sort of roughly as scaling what you need to scale the green contribution in the mini boom plot by in order to explain the mini boon excess. Um, and then, of course, unfold it for the reconstruction uh, in the mini boon detector. Um, and this is sort of this is chosen to be as physics agnostic as possible. Um, as sort of the you know vanilla sterile oscillation scenario doesn't seem to capture the excess of the lowest energies. Um, okay, great. Thank you. That's a very helpful clarification. <clears throat> okay. Other questions? Will people think of questions? I want to make sure we thank our speakers this session. Um, I learned a lot and thoroughly enjoyed this. So thank you everybody for really, really fantastic talks. Did that give people <laughs> additional questions they want to ask? I think the other fun one to ask is, what's your favorite of these theoretical models? What's, uh, what are you uh, taking bets on? What are you excited uh, to see checked? Uh, let's see. So I'm a little biased because I worked on number seven here. Um, so uh, it's, it's a model where you, but in general, it, it explores this class of models where you have a dipole coupled heavy neutral lepton that will decay into a photon in the mini boon detector. Um, and these, uh, these sorts of models, these are sort of very closely related to models that decay to a collimated E plus E minus pair. Um, and they seem to provide a good explanation of the mini boon excess, importantly, both in the energy and the angular distributions. Um, which is uh, something that's not uh, possible with just sort of the vanilla sterile neutrino model. Um, so I'm excited about the uh, heavy neutral lepton decays um, as an explanation. Okay, very cool. And then one I see also, this is a nice slide. We have this really great talk just now about heavy neutral leptons. You know, do you have any statements about how, what microboons reach will be for heavy neutral lepton searches? Um, I would point you to Anissa's talk tomorrow. Uh, so that will cover, um, I think, if, if I remember correctly, that will cover uh, at least some discussion of the heavy neutral lepton search of microbrun. Of course, we've already we've um, already done a, uh, I don't have a backup slide on it, but microbrun's already performed a study looking for heavy neutral leptons, um, I believe from K-on decays. Uh, so um, 
I could also I will also point you to that uh, PRL, which I can I can post a link in the chat um, after this. Although I suppose I'm the last to talk, so um, I just take it to matter most. So with that, sure. I think we are are done. Again, fantastic talks, everybody. I really enjoyed this. I hope you all did too. Um, please migrate on over to Mattermost and enjoy the rest of the conference.